Um, we're talking today to Billy de Klerk, who's Emeritus Curator of Paleontology at the Alb Albany Museum. Yes, I started in the museum in 1985. And we're chatting to you today about this amazing dinosaur discovery. Um, and the reason it's, it's, we're talking about it this week is that this is the week um, the article, the scientific article, was published about it in, a, in an international journal. So, Heterodontosaurus is the name of the dinosaur, right? Yes. Tell us, how do you find a dinosaur? Talk us through how you found this one. If All right, I'll, I'll start off by saying that... Um, We've known that there have been dinosaur fossils in the Karoo for a number of years, dating back to the first one uh, found in 1852. But um, the very first of this particular species of dinosaur was found in 1966. And that specimen uh, was described and it was given the name Heterodontosaurus tuckai. Um, and we've always referred to this animal since then, fossils that we've found of it, as Heterodontosaurus. This specimen is particularly important because it, uh, uh, it, it, it's a full skeleton. So to find these fossils, um, one first of all needs rocks that were deposited during the time that the dinosaurs lived. In other words, any, anywhere between 230 million and 190 million years ago. That is the time span when dinosaurs roamed this planet of ours. They then became extinct at 65 million years ago. So any, any rocks younger than that, we won't find dinosaurs. Uh, and any rocks prior to 232 million years ago won't have fossils either. So you need the right age of rocks, firstly. Secondly, you need the, the kind of rocks in which these, the sediments are accumulated. In other words, uh, you can't really find rocks, uh, fossils in, in marine uh, deposits. Uh, you can only find dinosaurs, really, they were land living animals, in sediments that were deposited on land by very big rivers or in lakes and that sort of thing that were on land. And, of course, you have to have then the very, importantly, the very correct conditions environmentally for the uh, animal to be deposited and rapidly buried. Um, um, first of all, it must die and then fall into some water uh, and be deposited and, and, and be covered up very quickly so it can preserve the, the bones. And then from there... Um, the bones will slowly be um, converted from original bone to uh, uh, to uh, rock, and that rock then still keeps the shape of the original uh, animal's bones. So uh, that's that's essentially what you need, and that then is buried, and over a long period of time, the overlying sediments would be eroded away and slowly expose the, the fossilized bone, and that's where we have to uh, find the fossils. But what I understand is that this um, particular skeleton, which you found northeast of Dordrecht, somewhere around there? Yes, um, a little was, village near the village of Rousseau. Right, was actually found in a stream bed. Now that must have made it awfully complicated. Very much so, it certainly did. The, the very first uh, very first fossils that were reported from that stream bed were actually on the banks of the stream, so they were above the water level uh, in the rock. But the, 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 the valley had eroded to the point where the rocks were exposed. And when we went and, uh, and walked up, when I walked up that river bed, slowly looking at every little nuance of color and texture, I noticed that at one spot I had what looked like real bones sticking out in the bed and it had been eroded uh, by uh, continuous flooding and uh, river 
sediment wearing it down like a sandpaper. So the, the bones exposed were actually quite smooth. Um, when I went back about a month later, that bone that had been exposed was in fact underwater. Now, to excavate a dinosaur that is actually in a stream of running water uh, just complicates it even more. The extraordinary process of finding this one, because you saw those exposed bones, and then you went a little bit further along, and you saw something tiny in the rock. Yes. Tell, um, tell us about that. <laughs> um, about a hundred meters away from the skeleton, um, I noticed a sort of white patch in the rock. The rock generally is of a reddish color, quite fine grained. Um, and this little white patch turned out to be the upside down lower jaw of a uh, dinosaur as well. It was exactly the same type of dinosaur. And this was absolutely remarkable because you, over a period of uh, 40, 50 years uh, and looking for dinosaur fossils, we've only found four or five specimens of heterodontosaurus, including this one. From what I hear, this was a tiny little piece of bone. How big was it in centimeters? Um, it was about the, the length of a matchbox. And you spotted that? Yes, it's and then when I scratched it open a little further, it was in the shape of a V. And that is, in fact, the lower, it was the synthesis of the lower jaw, the sort of joining point of the two mandibles. Um, and not mandibles, the, the lower jaw. But, um, and, and so, yeah, that was exposed upside down. And, and I could extract that quite easily by just excavating and, and breaking the rock around it. Uh, and eventually I was able to pop the entire rock off its uh, little pedestal that I created. And what made you think at that point it was something special? How did you know? <laughs> um, well, firstly, we find a lot of mammal-like reptiles in the Karoo rocks. So my first thought was that this was going to be a fairly old mammal-like reptile. Um, but that was not the case at all because the mammal-like reptiles you can identify them very easily by finding a single hole in the skull with one hole behind its skull for jaw um, a muscle attachment. So it's one eye, one hole is a mammal-like reptile. <clears throat> An eye socket followed by two holes in the skull is in fact a diapsid animal that uh, has these two holes for muscle attachment and that is usually of uh, um, a dinosaur type uh, or crocodile type animal. So it's uh, more reptilian, in fact. So that, and as soon as I had the, the two holes exposed, I knew I had something really special. And that was the exposure was, was actually done in the laboratory. I couldn't get to that uh, in the field. Tell us about the process of, of getting that igneous skeleton out. <clears throat> what did you have to do? Um, well, the traditional way of collecting fossils uh, in the Karoo is you uh, hammer and chisel uh, a channel around the fossil um, to the point where you have a trench around the fossil, which is slightly undercutting the fossil as well. So it's almost like a little mushroom. Uh, and then you would put a plaster of Paris jacket over the mushroom and let it dry, and then eventually you break it off. Now, we couldn't do that in this case because um, it was underwater. So we, I spoke to my good friend John Heppel, who was the techni uh, technician in the geology department, and I had acquired a very nice rock-cutting um, circular saw, which the building trade used for cutting up tiles and things. So this thing had a diamond blade, and I was able to use this to cut into the rock and create that uh, excavation, if I could put it that way, um, for uh, not using plaster of Paris, but actually cutting slabs of the original rock uh, out and uh, accumulating it or extracting it like that. So using a, a, a rock saw, we were able to cut through the water and, um, uh, and then position the cut so that you don't cut into any bone. 
that's the, 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 the tricky bit because as soon as you start cutting underwater, it creates plumes of sediment and it just discolors the water and you can't see what you're doing. So it was very tricky. We had to make little coffer dams so, and deflect the water away from where we were working. That sounds incredibly difficult and incredibly complicated. I heard there might have been one little difficult moment. Yes. Well, um, when a dinosaur dies, it's got a longish neck uh, and it starts to dry out. The skeleton starts to dry out before it's buried. And it tends to, the tendons in the uh, neck bones and associated with the neck uh, dry out and the tendons start to pull and distort the skeleton so that the, the head is pulled upwards. And I was looking at this very carefully trying to ascertain where the skull was because it wasn't exposed. All I could see was part of the neck, uh, sorry, only the uh, scapula and part of the upper torso and one or two legs uh, arms. And I was trying to protect the skull as best I could. Uh, when we were doing this cutting, and uh, I miscalculated the position of the skull, and my first cut that went in uh, went into the back of the skull slightly. So uh, I immediately w was able to stop the, the excavation and, and then put this, what I'd cut off, uh, I was able to reassemble the, the, the skull once I got to back to the laboratory. So that's not ideal. You don't want to destroy any bone that's been waiting for 200 million years to be uh, brought to surface, uh, cut with some terrible grinding diamond saw. <laughs> <laughs> um, so paleontologists usually work with, with a lot of people, a lot of fellow scientists, but also incredibly important in your work are people who help you prepare the skeletons or the materials. And I understand you indeed worked with many of those people, but you took the skull and prepared that yourself is what I understand. Tell us how long that took and what it entailed. Well, yes, firstly, um, one normally has a team of people in the field and uh, but I knew that the fossil was there and I knew it was a fairly small fossil and I realized I could set a date and travel up there with my good friend and colleague, John Heppel from the geology department at Rhodes. And he and I uh, went up for, for three, four, three days we spent. And um, we started working uh, immediately uh, and realizing that the river level had risen um, so that the whole thing was underwater as I mentioned. Um, I was going to do the preparation on the skull simply because the most diagnostic features of the, we didn't know what kind of creature it really was, so we needed to know what kind it is, and the most diagnostic features are really housed in the skull. So I took it back to the lab, I assembled the blocks and the bits and bo uh, pieces that had broken off the slabs that I had excavated, and uh, I started using uh, pneumatic air scribes, the compressed air driven air scribes. To remove the rock from the bone, uh, I used, tr traditionally we use uh, pneumatic air scribes, which are like dentist drills driven by compressed air. And that I did under a microscope in my laboratory uh, back at the Albany Museum. Um, and the first, order of business then is to stabilize the entire fossil. Uh, it's sometimes quite fragile and it wants to fall apart, so you use a, a chemical bonding liquid. Uh, we use Paraloid B42, or 72, sorry, um, and it uh, is a wonderful uh, glue. No matter, you can make it into whatever viscosity you want. And uh, by having it very, very thin, uh, diluted with acetone, you can get this to suck into the rock when you apply it and it then stabilizes the rock and then when you prepare it it comes off like part of the rock so with a very sharp needle being driven by this compressed air um, under microscope you can see exactly where the rock is and where the bone is so you move from the rock as it's 
vibrating away with this very sharp point uh, from the rock towards the bone. And you never touch the bone itself. It, the, the rock, when it gets close to the bone, there's a natural break there and it flies off by itself. So it's a very slow process and uh, it must have taken me a good uh, three year, two or three years uh, working on, on the, the, the preparation on an, on, on an off basis. I didn't uh, work on it all the time. If I'd worked on it flat out, I think I would have taken about perhaps a year. So it's, it is a very slow process. Um, but once it was out and I realized that what we had was something really special, I approached my uh, collaborators and colleagues in the field, um, uh, in particular Professor Jonah Chouinet uh, at the University of the Vitratisant, who is an expert in dinosaur fossils. So this was a very special fossil. Tell us why. Well, uh, Heterodontosaurus, we found in these rocks, which are dated at about 200 million years old, this is at the early stages of evolution of dinosaurs. And at that stage, dinosaurs older than, than 200 million years old um, tended to show more characteristics of meat-eating type animals. This particular animal was on the cusp of change from meat-eating, predominantly meat-eating dinosaurs to um, more herbivorous creatures. So it had a combination of teeth. Heterodontosaurus, by its very name, is hetero meaning different, dont teeth, saurus is lizard. Uh, so it had different typed teeth. Um, and you have in the front of the animal, in the, in the canines, are very prominent and very sharp when you've got two at the bottom and two at the top, so it had a very, very ferocious bite. But at the back in its mouth, uh, its cheek teeth were a battery of grinding teeth for grinding up vegetation. Now, it was always a problem trying to figure out what the canines were, were there for uh, when it was actually, um, its fruit was predominantly um, vegetation. Um, and the, the eventual thinking was that the canines uh, were used mainly for display and defense rather than uh, killing other animals. And I think that, that is really where we got. Um, the other feature of, of this heterodontosaurus was that it was uh, not quadrupedal. It was walking on, on its back legs. So it was a bipedal animal, uh, and it was able to use its its hands in a in a kind of um, uh, in, in a way that it could accumulate food from vegetation around. So it was uh, able to use its hands for um, uh, as a tool, not just for for locomotion. So, in in some ways, it was more like a bird, and in fact, looking at the reconstruction of it. Um, it, it looks almost like a almost like a Disney animal. It looks terribly sweet, and it's quite small, isn't it? You know, when we think of dinosaurs, we think of these great big lumbering creatures. Yes. But in yeah. fact, this was very small, wasn't it? Heterodontosaurus didn't uh, rise above hip height, uh, human hip height, uh, when it stood up on its back legs. So it was it was quite small. Yes, um, it's. It, 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 it's not really um, uh, on the line of evolution to birds at all. Uh, it was really on the line of evolution towards the herbivorous forms of dinosaur. And birds, as we know today, uh, arose from the carnivorous lineage in the dinosaurs. So the carnivorous, small carnivorous dinosaurs eventually evolved into true birds. So in effect, we have... Uh, still dinosaurs today in the form of birds. Final question. If, if a person, hypothetically, is wandering around and thinks that they've come across uh, an interesting skeleton that might be a fossil, um, what should they do? Well, I think uh, if it looks like a fossil, the first thing is to look around the fossil. Don't touch it at all, but uh, 
scour the countryside around it within about a 10 meter radius around the fossil and ascertain if anything had broken off and was still around it being kicked around broken off from the original uh, and gather whatever is um, loose and bring it closer to the fossil and make a little plinth of surrounding rock types to protect the exposed fossil plus it's it's um, broken off bits. Um, don't may, maybe take one piece that is quite diagnostic and take it to your local museum or university uh, to a qualified uh, person who could identify that bone or identify the nature of that uh, sample so that they can ask, say, well, this is bone or this is plant or whatever, and then they can. Uh, um, uh, get in touch with the uh, uh, an expert locally in South Africa. The best way of also finding out what you're dealing with is to take a, a cell phone photograph of the fossil, maybe from a few different angles, and, and email that to uh, any of the institutes in South Africa that do study fossils, like the university at, at, at Bits University, at UCT, uh, the Albany Museum in Grahamstown, um, and at the Bloemfontein Museum in Free State. So th those people then will be able to send the uh, information and, and also keep in mind the person who originally found the fossil will certainly be brought into the uh, loop of, of ex excavating it and uh, having local knowledge may be able to help. Billy, why is it important if you find something that uh, could be of paleontological or archaeological value, why is it important not to just take it home and put it on your mantelpiece? Well, for starters, you'll be losing a, a critical piece of uh, evidence of past life uh, that has happened on many occasions where wonderful fossils have been found on the mantelpiece. And I have three or four stories relating to that. Um, because every little puzzle, every little piece fits into the puzzle of this wonderful story that, that we have, uh, wonderful um, evidence that we have for the origin of life and also the evolution of life, how it diversified through time. So if we have more and more, the more fossils we collect, the greater our certainty of, of inference. We are able to um, make value judgments on these, on these pieces of, of material. So every fossil is important. We unfortunately don't have enough paleontologists employed in South Africa. So the idea of taking a digital photograph and sending it to your local uh, paleontology department, uh, there are only four in the country really, um, that is the way of disseminating the information and we are then able to uh, put the right people in place to, to do the necessary excavation and stabilization and so on, and further research. So it's important that we try and start off from a solid base of information that we are able to gather around the fossil. Billy, thank you so much for your time. This has been really interesting. And thank you. It's a pleasure, Sue. Yeah, it's been an interesting story, this whole... If you look at the paper that's come out on this uh, heterodontosaurus, it's only one facet of information that's been extracted from this fossil, and that is about the breathing, how, the, how these animals were actually breathing. So this, the senior author on the paper, Dr. Dr. Um, uh, Victor Rademacher, he spent uh, his master's degree studying this specimen and its rib cage. And uh, this is the story about how these animals were breathing. We couldn't really go ahead and, and re-describe the specimen. We know that Heterodontosaurus was already described in 1966, but we were able to improve on the description of this one. Um, but now we've got more information about its dentition, uh, uh, other other researchers may look at its locomotion and how it was moving around. Was it able to swim? Was it able to catch you know, fish, perhaps? All these sorts of questions can still be answered by looking at this fossil in greater detail. Thank you.